Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. I'm Chris Horner. This is Amstel Gold 2022. Now this course is not one of the five monuments, but it is one of the big one day races. In my day, they called this race the World Cup. They had 10, 10 one day races thereabouts back in the 90s, and this was one of the big, big races. Now, I love this race. I got to do it many times throughout my career as Amstel Gold, and then I got to do it two more times as a member of the US team doing the World Championships here. The year Oscar Camazine won in 1998, I believe it was, and then as far forward from that as 2012, when it was Philippe Gerbert who became world champion here on this course on the Kahlberg. And then, of course, since then, he won four times here at Amstel Gold Race. So this course is a little bit mythical when it comes to the cycling. I know a lot of people don't know a lot of the climbs and stuff, but everyone's heard of Valkenburg and everyone's heard of the Kahlberg because oftentimes Amstel Gold and those two world championships plus previous ones have finished on this course. So really appreciate this course. And one thing that I want to point out, at this is the one day, even Perry Roubaix does not match with the amount of stress that you have to fight for position and always stay awake at all moments throughout the Amstel Gold Course. Even Perry Roubaix, as dangerous as it is, it is more dangerous, of course, than Amstel Gold, but the difference is with Perry Roubaix, you fight before the cobbles and then you can rest when you come off the cobbles. Here at Amstel Gold, you can never relax. There might be times when the pace is going slower, but your head always has to be up. Your ears always have to be listening for the whistles that are being blown to mark out anything dangerous in any furniture out on the road. And you always, always have to have a hand on the brakes throughout the 255 kilometers. We're talking about a 160 mile course and it has 33 bergs on today's course. Narrow roads, bike paths. We did bike trails in my days, way back in the FDJ days, that we were racing coming off of small roads to smaller roads to a bike trail that we'd race on back in the day in the 90s. So one, one more little story before I get into Amstel Gold here. When I was racing for Frances de Jure. Now you guys know by the comments, if you read the comments on the channel, that I'm kind of known as the butcher because I butcher names and of course my English is bad, but my French is even worse. So one year here with FDJ, I'm having some bike problems. I go back to the team car and I'm telling the team director that my force is broken. I'm saying, just my force on my vélo c'est cassé. You guys know my English is bad, my French is worse, like I said. So the direct translation in English for the bicycle fork is like your dinner fork. In French, the direct translation for your bicycle fork is a fourchette and your dinner fork is a fourche. So I'm going back to the team car and I'm yelling and screaming because they can't figure out my French because I'm butchering it so much. As I'm yelling at the director, my force c'est cassé, he's just looking at me with this expression that he can't understand what I'm talking about because I'm telling him my dinner fork is broken. <laughs> and of course, from my view, when I'm saying my dinner fork is broken, it sounds exactly like my fork on my bike is broken. So we're arguing back there as I'm trying to get a different bike change. And finally, they'll figure out what I want and switch bikes with me and get me back on the road. Now when they do though, instead of giving me 11 tooth cog on the back, the spare wheel had a 12 and I'm getting ridden out of the group on every flat section here at Amstel Gold. So I always have a warm spot in my heart here for Amstel Gold for the troubles I've had here and then later when I've gone top 10 and been in the front group trying to vie for the win here at Amstel Gold. Along with the world championship rides here, like I said, always has a special part. Now when we get into the racing with 80 kilometers to go, there's a group of seven up the road and it's my man Victor Campanots. And you guys by now should know my man Victor Campanots is, is my guy because he's always doing something crazy. He's always putting in big attacks. He's always off the front, off the back, crashing, getting bike changed telling funny stories, winning stages of the Giro d'Italia and such. So he is the man when it comes to putting on a show in bike races. And he's in that front group of seven with, of course, Jumbo Visma's Nathan Van Hooydunk. Those are the two threats up there. Now, shortly after those guys are in the break, there's crashes back there in the peloton left and right, and we're only about five kilometers in the stage. The one guy I want to point out in the crash is Bahrain Victorious there, Jack Haig. Now, I'm pointing Jack Haig out because... Bahrain Victorious, in my book, Before Amstel Gold Started Here Today, is the team to beat. 
the writer to beat. Matthew Vanderpool is the single best writer in here at Amster Gold, of course, because Walt Van Aert isn't starting. But as a complete team, when I look at the roster, I see it's Bahrain Victorious that has a solid group here with four big time hitters and Jack Haig, Dylan Toons, Mate Mohoric, and of course, Jan Tratnik. Those four riders we know can go the big distance here when we're talking about 250 kilometer races. So when you see Jack Haig crash, I wanna point that out because that's losing 25% of the strength that they had before this race started. Now, at 67 kilometers, 65 kilometers to go thereabouts, there's an interview with Mate Mohoric, and Mate Mohoric is one of the big hitters, winner Milano San Remo earlier in this season. And with that four-man team, we know we want to listen in closely to his instructions on what he thinks Bahrain Victorious need to do. He clearly points out that they need to be a force, they need to be aggressive, they need to keep strong numbers in the front group of favorites when this race blows up, and they need to not come to the finish line with Matthew Vanderpool. Because as he says with his own words, if you come to the finish line with Matthew Vanderpool, you're going to lose. So keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to that story many times throughout this race here at Amstel Gold. Now, the funny thing with my man Victor Campanots is Victor Campanots, Ida Schelling from Bora Hansgro, some for some reason, and I don't know why, they get gapped off on the next climb. Ida Schelling, to my eyes, looks like he's suffering, but Victor Campanots looks smooth up there on the pedals. And then shortly after that, we're going to see Victor Campanots drop Ida Schelling, and then Victor Campanots going to take a nature break. Now, when I'm sitting on the couch, I'm wondering, Okay, Victor Campanas, you know you're my man, but what are you doing taking a nature break when the break is going up the road? At this point in time, the break only has about 50 seconds, and we're about 50 kilometers thereabouts of the stage to the finish line. So I'm thinking, Lotto Sudo, why do you want Victor Campanas taking a nature break right now instead of up the road? Then when we go back up to the peloton, after Victor Campanas is caught by the peloton, he gets on the front, he does one pull, and then after that is Tim Wellens going on the tack. So, Victor Campanots, my man, you gotta explain this one to me because I'm still smiling from ear to ear trying to figure out what kind of comical tactics were being used here with taking a nature break, taking Ida Schelling out of the break that was way too fatigued and you didn't have to worry about him, taking a pull on the front of the peloton, and now another Lotto Sudo rider goes up the road. Absolutely strangest tactics I've seen, but okay, Lotto Sudo's trying to be aggressive. He'll get brought back. Now, next team to get on the front with 45 kilometers to go is Team Enos. Enos got four guys at the front of the peloton there. Ben Turner's taking magical pulls at the front of the peloton with Michael Kwiatkowski, Dylan Van Barley, and of course, the real hitter and on Enos is Tom Pedcock. Those four guys are on the front and they're drilling. Only problem is, you got to remember, let's go back to Mate Mohoric's interview because in his interview, he says you have to have numbers with the favorites and you have to be able to attack Matthew Vanderpool. So when I'm looking at only four Enios guys on the front right now, I'm thinking this might not be such a great tactic when you're pulling around Matthew Vanderpool back there in the peloton and you're going to start losing numbers up the road for Team Enios. Now, Ben Turner does a great job, pulls 10K, brings the breakaway all the way back together, and when we start the next climb with about 35 kilometers to go, the Kettenberg, Ben Turner's pull at the front is done, and now Michael Kwiatkowski's going to work. The Super Domestique X Road World Champion winner here at Amster Gold is on the front, and he is driving it hard. He splits it to a group of 11 up there, but Matthew Vanderpool is in that group, so this is not looking absolutely fantastic, but there are two Enos guys there with Tom Pecock and Michael Kwiatkowski doing the work. Next moment, just a few hundred meters later, it's Tis Benut Yumbo Visma that throws in attack. He'll split the group to about five or six up front, and Matthew Vanderpool is gapped in the second group of five back there. He'll do one big acceleration and close back up to that front group, pulling the guys with him, and that'll make an 11 strong group up there with two Enos riders, Michael Kwiatkowski, Tom Peacock. Matthew Vanderpool there, Dylan Toons is there, and now I want to point something out about Dylan Toons in this group of 11, because Matthew Vanderpool is in this group, like I already pointed out, behind in the second chase group back there of about 10, 12 guys. They have two Bahrain victorious riders back there. It's Mate Mahorch, who did the interview earlier on today's race, and when we saw him and his tactics on today's race, was said that they wanted to have numbers in the front group of favorites with Matthew Vanderpool. 
The only way to win here was to get rid of Matthew Vanderpool with numbers and to be the forceful team up front and then attack before the final. Now, with Dylan Timms in that front group, he is breaking away from the tactics of Mate Mohoric and Bahrain Victorious because he's continuing to ride through with Matthew Vanderpool, two Enos riders, Alexander Camp from Trek, Stefan Kuhn, who has a teammate behind, and Valentin Madois, Cosnefoy from AG2R, Matthews is back there from Bike Exchange, and Mark Hershey from UAE is in the front group. I have not said Mark Hershey's name on the butterfly effect in many, many months. We have to go way back to last year, probably at the Tour de France, when I'm talking significantly about a big, big win from Mark Hershey. But he's in the front group. He's doing small rotations through at the front of the group. This is a good option for UAE team Emirates with Mark Hershey up front. But he does have one teammate in that second group back there in the form of Matteo Trentin. So they still have options instead of working at the front group up there with Matthew Vanderpool if if they want to pull that card. But it's not a card that I would pull at this moment. Bahrain Victorious, when you're talking about Dylan Toons, I'd use that card right now. Stop working in this front group and bring my two amazing teammates, winner of Milano Sam Remo back there, Mate Mohorge, and allow him and Jan Tracknick to get to this front group if you're asking me as a director for Bahrain Victorious. Now the last rider in that front group is Casper Asgreen representing Quick Step up there. Casper Asgreen's on good form. We've seen him throughout the, all the classics. He's always in the front group unless there's a mechanical or, or he's just blowing his legs up to pieces. But here at Amstel Gold, he's riding correctly. He's rotating through but never doing too much. They don't have much options. I didn't remember seeing a rider in that second group back there chasing. That's out about 30, 35 seconds. So Casper Asgreen for quick step. He's on his own here at Amstel Gold. With 22 kilometers to go, when they come up near the today's finish line at Amstel Gold, Michael Kwiatkowski will throw an attack. This attack is just kind of more of a rolling off the front, but he gets a gap on the favorites back there, and he starts getting on the pedals. Now with 20 kilometers to go, they're going down the descent into a hard left turn. Last year, I remember there was a crash in this very same left turn. This time, it's going to be Benoit Cosnefoy and Tis Benoit, who don't crash but go off the road into the dirt and then come back on on the sidewalk. Now up front, when that happens, Benoit Cosnefoy, AG2R, he's had enough messing around with the group back there playing tactical games, and he gets on the pedals and throws in a big acceleration, and he's going across to Michael Kwiatkowski who's under 20 seconds up the road. Benoit Cosnefoy has been fabulous throughout this early part of the season, but he's yet to gain that big, big win yet here for AG2R. Now, he bridges right across to Michael Kwiatkowski. Behind, we're going to see a host of attacks start with Dylan Toons, and then that's followed by Benoit, who throws in the next big attack. Now, to my surprise, while I'm sitting on the couch, it's Tom Pedcock Inos who throws in a massive acceleration to bridge up to the two leaders in front. I don't think this was a great tactic at this moment. The gap is about 20 seconds up there to his teammate, Michael Kwiatkowski, and Tom Pedcock is throwing in a dangerous attack here because if he pulls all the group up to him, then Michael Kwiatkowski's working at the front, Tom Pidcock's working here, and the group behind might all come back together if Tom Pidcock does not have the legs to go across this gap solo. He doesn't, and it's Dylan Toons Bahrain Victorious that catches Tom Pidcock and then disposes of him with his own attack trying to go solo up to the two leaders up front. Now, when we go up front, it's Michael Kwiatkowski up there along with Benoit Cosnefoy, and they're working very well together. They have 20 more kilometers to go on today's stage, and they're doing pull for pull, which looks about even to my eyes when I'm sitting on the couch. Dylan Toons is back there working as hard as he can, solo trying to bridge his gap. He won't make it across. He's out there for about two kilometers until he gets brought back by the GC group behind, led by Tom Pidcock back there, Matthew Vanderpool, Stefan Kuhn, Alexander Camp. Everybody back there is taking pulls, but they're not taking the super big, hard pulls that you need to close the gap to Michael Kwiatkowski and Ben Kwasnefoy up front. And with 10 kilometers to go, the gap is still only 25 seconds. 
Now when I'm sitting on the couch, I'm sure I'm thinking the same thing you fans are. When is Matthew Vanderpool going to do that massive acceleration and bridge this gap? We've seen it done before. He is a winner here at Amster Gold, and that is exactly how he won a couple seasons back when he just disposed of everyone, bridged across the multiple gaps, and won Amstel Gold. So I'm still sitting on the couch in anticipation, watching for the big acceleration from Matthew Vanderpool. In my eyes right now, throughout this whole 80 kilometers, all the way to this last 10 kilometers to go, Matthew Vanderpool has been perfect. Always doing just enough, but not showing too many cards. Not showing if he's on great form or if he's on just a little bit off possibly, and that's why he's missed a couple splits, but always capable of closing those gaps whenever the gap opened up on him. Now with seven kilometers to go, the gap starts to expand, expand and now it's 35 seconds up there to the two race leaders. With four kilometers to go, the gap's 23 seconds. It's Casper Asgreen throwing in attack and Tom Pedcock, the team player back there, he is playing a role now. I didn't like his tactics, tactics going up the climb, chasing his teammate, but now he's fully, he's fully in support up there of Michael Kwiatkowski having a shot at winning Amstel Gold. He's directly on Casper Asgreen's wheel, which will neutralize that attack. And then with 1.8 kilometers to go, the attack I have been waiting for on pins and needles, Matthew Vanderpool throws in a massive attack. Casper Asgreen doing everything he can to close the gap. Now up front at 1.2 kilometers to go, it's Michael Kwiatkowski and he had negotiates Benoit Cosnefois to take the front. Now, he's got this card to play. Remember, he's got Tom Pecock in the back. We know Tom Pecock has a lot of speed. So if this group comes back, Tom Pecock can win the sprint. So this is what I'm talking about when you go back to Gent Webb again, when Benny Gourmet won that stage and Yumbo Visma, Christoph Laporte had the Walt Van Art card. At this point in time, Michael Kwiatkowski has the Tom Pitcock card. He'll pull that out of his pocket. So Benoit Cosnefois is stuck on the front for more than a kilometer into the finish of today's race. Now with 700 meters to go, Benoit Cosnefois still on the front on the left side. With 500 meters to go, he's on the front. But it's Tis Benut back there, Yumbo Visma, who just jumped out of the favorites back there chasing the two leaders up front. He's got a gap back there on all the favorites, and he's coming fast up to the two riders up front. Benoit Cosnefois looks back at 300 meters to go. He can see Tis Benut coming and the, all the favorites back there coming like a freight train up on the two leaders in front. At 250 meters to go, he'll drift all the way to the right side of the fencing. At 200 meters to go, Cosnefois starts his sprint. He knows he's got to start a little bit earlier than he wants to because Tis Benut and all the favorites are hot on the wheels right behind. Now, with that acceleration, he looks like he's in for a solid chance here to win at Amp still gold. With 100 meters to go, it's Kwiatkowski that swings off his wheel. And with 40 meters before the line, they're side by side, neck and neck, as it's, you know a bike throw is going to decide the winner here at Amstel Gold. With a throw at the line, nobody knows who won today's race if you're sitting on the couch. Now I saw Benute pound his handlebar, so I assume Michael Kwiatkowski won today's Amstel Gold. But minutes after the stage, guess what? It's Benoit Cosnefra, AG2R rider, who's celebrating with his teammates. And then we got to wait 5, 10 minutes longer. If you remember right, last year was the same way. We had to wait 20 minutes to find out that Wout Van Aert won Amstel Gold last year. Now today, it's almost the exact same scenario. We got 10, 15 minutes invested after the finish of today's race to find out who's going to win, even though AG2R has us believing that they are the winner here at Amstel Gold. Now, right after that, now we get to see it's Enios that are celebrating this year at Amstel Gold. They lost last year with Tom Pedcock after 20-minute review. This year, they needed a 10-15 minute review in order to figure out that Michael Kwiatkowski wins his second Amstel Gold as all of the Enios riders are celebrating a big, big one-day victory here at Amstel Gold. Now, to round out the podium, Tis Benut held off the favorites back there for third on today's Amstel Gold race. A fabulous race, super exciting to watch. 
nail biter all the way to the finish, crossing the line, and then you had to wait 15 more minutes and you get highs and lows depending on if you are an AG2R fan or an Enyos fan. But when it's all said and done, it's Michael Kwiatkowski on the big step of the podium. And of course, Benoit Cosnefoy second with Tis Benut rounding out the podium. Congratulations, guys. I was entertained throughout today's Amstel Gold Race. Another fantastic race here in 2022. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. And I'll see you on the next edition of the Butterfly Effect.